plant protein or animal protein, which is more bioavailable? We've all got our opinions. Many people will go one way or the other. However, it's not common that we look at absolute data that tries to be as objective as possible with these things. And that's what I'm going to show you today, because like I said, we all have our opinions, but what does the data actually suggest? And I've got what I think is a relatively decent study that tries to answer this question. So uh, let's take a look and then we'll go from there. This is the study in question, which should be on your screen now. Um, it's only a few months old, actually. It came out at the back end of, of last year. I'm filming this now in 2025. Um, and this is something which I came across uh, as part of my general reading. So you can see the title here. It says, True Digestibility of Tryptophan in Plant and Animal Protein. First thing to do when you look at something like this is really to look at the title. And uh, I know it sounds patronizing, but it is very crucial. Um, what the paper actually shows and what the title suggests or what the abstract suggests they're not often the same thing. And here, you know, the, the first word is, is what we need to draw attention to. It says true digestibility. It's, it's a difficult word, I think, to, to get away with here um, because, you know, th there are many variables at play because everyone is slightly different. So I don't think you can say true digestibility because everyone is going to have a range. Um, so I think that's a question mark for me. But Moving on from that, if we got rid of that, digestibility of tryptophan in plant and animal protein. So tryptophan, for those that don't know, it is one of the amino acids that we need. Um, and all protein, when we eat it, it breaks down into the individual amino acids. We take those amino acids and we use them to build things in our body like enzymes and, and, and muscle and things like that. So tryptophan is one of the amino acids that we will get from eating whatever food we eat in terms of the protein content. This is uh, the link you should see on the top there as well. Um, but I'm going to go down here and, and look at this. Now, the reason I'm not going to show you the full paper um, is because I can't actually get hold of the, the full paper, unfortunately, which would be a lot better to look at. Um, but I think there's enough here to throw some, uh, throw some knowledge in, in the mix. So if we scroll down here, um, we have a, a look. Uh, let's scroll down. So we've got... Um, a dias score, which is trying to look at the digestibility of certain amino acids. And it says, you know, evaluated using this score, protein quality, requires ileal digestibility values um, of individual amino acids. Now, ileal, ileum, okay, that's part of our digestive tract, as part of our anatomy. But the thing is, you know, what I would say is, well, who's ileum? Okay, is it's not mine, because I wasn't part of the study. I wasn't one of the subjects in this. Um, and I think this is where the extrapolation that is done in, in many studies kind of tends to break down because everyone has a different level of, of digestibility of the same product. And so when it says ileal, I don't think it means in general, it might be referencing that, but realistically, I think it only means in the tests that were done um, and it can't be extrapolated to every single person. Um, and it says, however, true tryptophan digestibility has rarely been quantified in humans. Um, that may be the case, but I don't think that the, the findings from this will relate to every single human being out there for the reasons I've just outlined. Now, what I like about this is the fact that they used um, a tracer. So where does it say that? Um, methodology. So they, these are all the sources they looked at. Um, and they looked at uh, sort of a radioactive tracer to look at how it goes through the, the body, essentially. And... The nice thing about that is you're actually measuring how much of it ends up in one particular place, which means it's not an opinion that, you know, this was digested really well, or this was digested really badly. Um, you get a, 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 an actual reference, a quantifiable reference of where has it ended up? Has it ended up here? Yes or no. Um, which I think is, is a good way of doing things. As well as that, diet was calculated for each test protein using digestibility corrected scores, in comparison with the requirement score for adults. This is where I think one of the negative points of this study comes into play. What is a requirement score? Um, it sounds, I mean, different people will have a different definition of that, I think, but requirement is 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 a construct, right? Um, in, in this context, I think. And it's, it's a label, it's an opinion, and a requirement score is something that's generated based on more opinions and labels. So I think that's a difficult thing to, to throw in there, really. Um, as well as that, you know, when you're looking at all of these things, you're looking at digestibility, right? 
um, as you can see here in the results. Digestibility is a factor of multiple things. So for example, we, we have to look at what is in that person's gut, say the gut microbiome. Now, the gut microbiome is going to be different for every single person because everyone eats very slightly differently or, or very highly differently from each other. And so that microbiome is going to be very much responsible for what we can and can't digest. And so if we were to say that all oh, that's different for everyone, then it means that, you know, you, you can never extrapolate this to everyone, which is why I think you, you can't take these results as being absolute. And it is just in, in the population that they individually study and that's all. Um, as well as that, there's other digestive system factors. You know, different people have different levels of gut permeability. As an example, if you have a lot of lectins in your diet and you have a high amount of gut permeability, then the same food is going to be digested very, very differently for, for you than for other people. So there are factors and, and characteristics here which have not been controlled for as far as I can tell. Um, and as well as that, you know, even though we have these, these results here, um, we can say, look, it says the true tryptophan digestibility determined in this study ranged from around, say, 67.6% .6 plus or minus 3.7. That was for whole mung bean. And the chicken was 95.9% .9 plus or minus 2.2%. So it's a very, very big difference. Now, does this mean that animal protein is more bioavailable than plant protein? I don't think you can suggest that. And I don't think the paper actually can suggest that either because tryptophan is one individual amino acid. It, they didn't look at every single amino acid in every single protein source either. But it, it, based on this single amino acid, we can say that that's, that's what was found. So it's a start and it's, it's something that adds to the weight of evidence that many people believe that animal protein is more bioavailable than, than plant, which, you know, I, I'm a big believer in that as well, but I don't think this supports the whole of animal protein versus the whole of, of plant protein, if we're being scientifically valid. Um, and if you look at this range, you know, plus or minus 3.7%, plus or minus 2.2% for the different food sources, I personally think that there is an incredibly large range of gut uh, digestibility for different people because they've all got different diets. And so that range, I think, potentially can be even bigger when you look at even bigger populations as well. And that's just what they found for this. So why then is there a difference in bioavailability between plant sources and animal sources? If they both have tryptophan, as an example, which is the amino acid studied here, why is it that we, we you know, can work with it very differently in this source versus that source. What is it about the source that means we can take what we want from that source much easier than other places? Well, think about it this way. Imagine you go into two different shops and they both sell the same thing, like a, I don't know, a particular TV that you're trying to buy. In one shop, there's not many people around and you can just go up to the shelf and pick it up, put it in your basket, pay for it and walk out. And you've taken what you need from that source, if you like, from that shop. In another shop, imagine that there are far too many people crowding it and they're all scrambling over each other to try and get to things. You can go into that shop, but because of what's going on around you, you're not really able to even physically reach the TV that you'd like to go and pay for it. And so you leave without actually buying what you came in for. So two different sources offer the same product, the same TV, but because of what's going on there, you can't take each one. And, and there's different things going on in plant sources versus animal sources. When you look at the fact that you know, the fiber content is much higher um, in, let's say, you know, a, a carrot or a whole mung bean or all these other things that they've looked at, chickpeas, yellow, yellow peas versus, say, chicken meat and beef and all these sorts of things, that's, you know, part of the story. And that think of that as being, in, if we're going to stick with the analogy, the shop being too full and everyone's scrambling over each other. We, a lot of people say that, you know, fiber helps reduce the speed at which glucose enters the bloodstream. And we don't have the glucose in the first place. That'll work even better. But it also affects the ability to reach in and grab what you want. Lots of other things as well, I think. And so fiber is, is a big difference. That plays a role. As well as that, you have to look at the way that amino acids are actually branched together to create different proteins. Yes, the individual amino acids may be the same. So you may have tryptophan in, in this source and this source. And if you just looked at the tryptophan, it may be the same molecule and you've got no idea where it came from. But realistically, it's never going to come on its own. You know, that it would just be a powder if it was just in isolation. But it's linked with other amino acids to create proteins. And the way they're linked in terms of, you know, how linear or how branched they may be 
plays a role in how well our enzymes can actually break those peptide bonds to get at the individual amino acids as well. And because they're branched in different ways in plant versus animal sources, we have a different ability for each source to get what we want in terms of the amino acid content. And as well as that, I mentioned already gut permeability. When people have a lot of lectins, gluten is a lectin as an example, that means that we have different levels of gut health and gut health includes things like gut permeability. And we can't necessarily control for that because there's no sort of meter or device we can buy to measure as a number how permeable someone's gut may be. And so because we can't control for that, we can't fully say, you know, this is absolutely more bioavailable in every single person versus that because we can't control for every single factor. But I think this goes some way um, to try and show us that there is a difference between different sources. And of course, I personally think animal sources are more bioavailable than plant sources. Um, you can decide whatever you want, but I hope the study um, shows you some actual data um, as to the size of the difference in bioavailability between different sources.